If you haven't heard, um, we're living in an era of big data. Um, I heard that many, many times today. But um, I would also say that we're living in an era of missing data. Many countries in the world don't even have basic census data or infrastructure data essential to allocate desperately needed resources. <clears throat> this lack of data further marginalizes what are already vulnerable communities. And this map produced by the Missing Maps Project, um, we see the lack of infrastructure in many areas uh, in the global south. I seek to change that power dynamic by building data in unique ways to help fill the gap and synthesize that data into tools that have a public benefit that can change policy. It's a process that I talk about in my book, Data Action. So what is data action? <laughs> I love telling stories with data, so let's tell a story. Um, and I'm taking you to Nairobi, Kenya. I do a lot of work in Nairobi, and I've been working on issues around transportation. Um, and if you look at this map, you can see, or not map, this video, you can see that Nairobi streets are always very clogged. Um, the city of Nairobi is developed way faster than the transportation systems could catch up with it. And this is something that's happening in cities across uh, the world as people are moving in at a rapid pace. Um, but one of the things that when I came to Nairobi to kind of build their transformation model, I didn't have data on these buses. These are uh, the main way people get around and they're called matatus. Um, and they represent close to 80% of the vehicles on the roadway. So you can understand if I had a model, I need the data about where the buses go so I can really accurately model that. Um, and it was shocking, not only that there wasn't data about where these buses went, but the citizens didn't even have a map. So I thought, how could I create raw data for my model that everyone could use um, and build upon? We took, if you've ever been to Nairobi, Kenya, people use their cell phones for everything. They have something called M-Pesa, which they use it to actually buy bus fares, buy coffee, you use it for your taxi ride. And we thought we could leverage the ubiquitous nature of cell phone use in Nairobi uh, to collect this data. We built an app with the, our partners at the, at the University of Nairobi, and we collected data in something called GTFS. You probably don't know what GTFS is, but you guys have all used it. GTFS is the data standard in Google Maps that allows you to route yourself in transit. I stop and take note in this because collecting data in an existing standard helps to make it instantly more usable uh, because there's so much open source software developed for it. And that's what we did in Nairobi. We had a hackathon. We invited the local tech community to teach them about the GGSF data format, and from that hackathon, five different apps developed by the local tech community uh, were produced. Um, and also, it was the first informal transit system in Google Maps. Now there are many, and we help many cities across the world do that, but by collecting the data in the system, we were able to uh, negotiate with Google to get them online. Here you can see the data streaming uh, in our application, creating the roadway stops and routes. Uh, but you can see that understanding the complexity of the system is as is, is hard as routes are overlapping. So we needed a way for everyone with or without a smartphone to understand the Matatu system. Um, so we started to think of a format of a traditional subway map. Uh, we teamed up with stakeholders in the community, including bus drivers, who helped us edit the map, as you can see here um, in this video. Um, making these Matatu systems more visible had a huge benefit to Nairobi. For the first time, it showed that the Matatus were an organized system run by a union who decided and set routes and stops. This meant that 
NGOs, multilaterals could help and think about ways to make these systems safer. We worked with the government uh, to edit the maps as well as focus groups of riders. Um, and ultimately, the map was released um, in the newspapers um, and went viral on the, the internet. Um, the city, in fact, made it the official map. Semi-formal transit provides mobility around the world. It's not just Nairobi that has this kind of system. In fact, most cities in the world have these kind of informal transit systems. And our work has inspired cities from Amman to Managua, and we now have a global network of over 40 cities that we've helped develop this data, and we have a resource center based in Africa and Latin America. So creating data can just start with one small app. Um, as you can see, my work isn't just about building data. It's about also creating unique ways to communicate that data so that policymakers can uptake that result. We saw that in Nairobi with the map, it had a huge impact on the way uh, policymakers interacted. In the last few years, I started to work on another issue with global effect, migration. Here we're looking at a visualization I created from data collected from migrants on their passage between Colombia and Panama, showing that 42 countries as far away as China and Africa were represented in the, the data set. And we got this data uh, through um, hotspots provided to the migrants along their migration pathway. But we wanted to know what motivated migrants to leave. And so we, together with the World Food Program, the Migration Policy Institute, the Inter-American Development Bank, and the Organization of American States, interviewed 5,000 migrants about what uh, motivated them to leave, how much it cost them, how were they traveling, what were the means that they were migrating. The data sample was taken from a region in which, in these countries, which were experiencing high levels of migration to, due to climate change, violence, and economics. And together, our team created a report, the kind of report you might typically see. Uh, we were very excited about our findings. But I really was thinking, this is not going to get the message across. I looked at the stacks of reports in my uh, colleague's office and I thought, how can we really make a difference with some of the really important findings that came out? And so I asked the World Food Program, can we make a tool that we would present and use and allow people to interact with the data uh, to find their own insights? And they took that leap of faith and for a congressional hearing in 2021, we presented an interactive experience. And uh, mind you, in 2021, congressional hearings were having, happening on Zoom. So we put the link in the Zoom and allowed people to walk through our website. Uh, we contextualized the work within the larger issues and historical framework of migration. Uh, but one of the biggest findings in our report, can you believe it, is that migrants in just one year spent $2.2 billion to migrate. Can you believe that we spend $2.9 billion to keep those same migrants out? Um, and so one of the things we wanted to show is that also migrants are spending collectively as much as their countries are spending on primary education uh, in the hope of a new life. The cost of migration to them was really significant. Migrants take on extreme debt. We allow the congressman to explore the data numbers, and ultimately we recommended that Congress provide more legal visas for Central American migrants. Um, and just to give note, you know, when we think about legal visas right now in our agricultural workforce, 73% um, of our agricultural workforce is migrants, 93% of those are Mexican. Um, so what we're saying is let's open up legal pathways for this really critical uh, population of Central American migrants. And that's exactly what 33 senators did after our congressional hearing. 
citing our findings in our report to the Biden administration. Just two months later, the Biden administration opened up more legal visas for our, um, migrants working in the agricultural workforce, specifically thinking about Central American migrants. We were so excited about the impact of this visualization, but we wanted to know, really, did we have an impact? Did the visualization actually do something? So we went, interviewed people who were at the congressional hearing after, and we asked them, what effect did these visualizations have on the result? And almost all of them said, I felt like I could trust the information, that I could find my own insights. Could I learn new things from the way that you allowed us to explore that data. Obviously, we're presenting it to them, though, so that's a, a kind of artifice that we're creating, but that kind of trust in the ability to interact with data kind of helped them build their own trust in the system. After the congressional hearing, we wanted migrants to have a way to tell their story, um, so not just creating visualizations for them, and so we took this idea of a tapestry of motivations, which was in our tool, and this tapestry shows the reasons that migrants motivated, motivated to leave. Um, and we use it as inspiration to create a tapestry out of money, um, thinking about that $2.2 billion. That tapestry was built with migrants from Central America, um, in a shelter in Mexico City. The tapestry was put to get in the World he Food Program headquarters in Rome. Um, and here you can see um, that the overwhelming reason that migrants leave are this blue color or economic reasons. Red is uh, security, uh, purple is violence, uh, yellow is uh, quality of life, green is climate change. And in that headquarters, they were able to interact with the data, and each dollar had a chip in it. And they could tap that chip on the screen and actually hear that migrant story. This visualization had a huge impact on the World Food Program. They were at their executive board meeting when this was happening, trying to raise funding at a time when lots of funding was being diverted to the war in Ukraine and they wanted to make sure money was still coming into the cause of migrants. This is David Beasley and the ambassador of Panama who really took heart in this topic. And in fact, David Beasley went along the migration trail after he saw this to help kind of garner more support through his Twitter feed. And this is how we take data to action. We build teams to work together. We collect data uniquely. We quantify the results uniquely. We open that data up through visualizations and we iterate along the way. I hope I inspired all of you to take data to action and use your superpower to create change and influence policy in this world. Thank you.